I can tell you this. I saw my mom and I was sad about it. But I was so upset. I was full of rage because they stopped me. I cursed at the doctors and their nurses. I didn't want them to stop me. there my name is sean and this is suicide noted on this podcast i talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories every year around the world millions of people try to take their own lives and we almost never talk about it we certainly don't talk about it enough and when we do talk about it many of us including me are not very good at it so one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors, candid conversation, so that we can help more people in more places feel a little less shitty and a little less alone. Now, if you listen to the podcast, you've heard me say several times in the past weeks that we've got a membership program we're working on. It is now live. Now, that will not change anything with respect to us releasing a new episode every Monday, a candid conversation with an attempt survivor, but we are offering additional perks like exclusive monthly events and discounts on merchandise, which is not yet ready, but will be soon, in addition to some special episodes for your financial support. There is a link in the show notes. There's actually several things in the show notes, so check them out. But you will see towards the top, membership. There's a link. Follow it to learn more about what it is all about, what it includes, why we're doing it, and more about our thoughts on this subject matter. Check it out. We'd love your support. We know that not everybody can or wants to do that, but those of you that can, uh, help if you can. Check it out. Now, you might be thinking, what exactly will we do with this money? It's a very fair question, and here's what we'd like to do. Boost our media presence. Take the show on the road like we did for NAMI NC a few months ago. We want to develop more programs to help more people in more places. And we also want to transcribe and translate our episodes so that people who don't necessarily speak or understand English can also hear these conversations in some format, whether it's audio or text or other. And one final thing, we are doing our very best to maintain our independence, to not be directly aligned with specific organizations whose mission or values don't align with ours necessarily. And if you notice, we only put on ads towards the very end of the show because we don't want to interrupt the conversation. We don't want to promote things that we don't believe in or are not related. So that helps out a little bit, but really because we want to maintain our independence, it's very, very difficult to raise money. We continue to look for sponsorships and other sources of revenue, but uh, this is one other way to do it. So if you're interested, have a peek, have a look, and join us if you can. However you help, however you participate or get involved, we really do appreciate it. Now, if you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And keep in mind, we are talking about suicide on this podcast like we do every week, like the title suggests. It's not a good fit for everyone. We know that. Uh, So take that into account before or as you listen. But we do hope you listen because there is so much to learn. Today, I am talking with Raul. Raul lives in California and he is a suicide attempt survivor. Hey, Raul. So, you, Raul, you're in uh, California? Yes, yes, I am. Reached out to talk to me, and thank you for that, about suicide and your own experience with that. Hearing your podcast and hearing other people's accounts and everything, like, I, I, I feel like that. I can feel yeah. it. It's, that's exactly how I feel, but we, we don't have those open conversations. We do not, correct. I completely agree with you. I think, generally speaking, when people think it's open, it's not that open. No, I I can argue very strongly no, because uh, one of of the things that I feel very strong about, I don't know if it is because of the trauma of being in the hospital, it doesn't help. It makes people feel the next time that I do this, I'm going to do it right. That's, That's what it feels like. That's what I felt like when I got out of it. Yeah, you learn what not to do and what it teaches you. Exactly. But it doesn't necessarily prevent you. No, at all. Or want to take a different path. It just, I'm sure there's a lot of people that go into those kinds of hospitals and have decent experiences. I've talked to some of them. But a lot of them do say, it was very quick. Quickly, I realized, all right, the only thing I'm going to do in here is do what I got to do to get out. 
Number two, I'm going to do what I can do not to go back. That doesn't mean they don't need help. It means they're not going to a hospital. Now what? Yep. As much as I'd like to believe that these conversations in this podcast helps, and I do think it helps, yeah, it only helps so much. People need yeah. some serious fucking, and it's not out there. So what is? how did you find the podcast? And what led you to look for that kind of podcast? I, I was I was just searching suicide. How to do it, how to prevent it, what kind of help I, I, I needed. So I was looking for anything, not a specific. And I came across the podcast at the title. I'm like, okay. you a collection of notes. I want to see what other people were feeling. And I started listening. I like the openness. I like the candid of it. It wasn't intense. It's just a conversation. And that's one of the things that draw me into like keep listening and listening to other stories and listen to everyone's. When was that um, that you put that into wherever you put it and found the podcast? Do you know? About September this year. Okay. Why that word at that time? I wasn't feeling well. And I got to a point where I'm like, how do I stop this? I've done mm-hmm. this before. How do I do it better this time? How do I get to a point where I can find easier ways to do it or faster ways or simple ways of doing it? And that's the mentality that I had at the time. You feel that way right now? No. If you ask me the same question three days ago, I would have said like, yeah. But I feel within the last three days, I don't feel better. I don't feel like great. I don't feel like what it doesn't feel as bad. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you thought about suicide? What was that like to think about that possibility? It was uh, 2013. Before 2013, you never thought about it. Not like that. Never. It, it never crossed my mind. It, never, it, was, it wasn't an option. And did you deal with mental health challenges or were you mostly like smooth sailing? You know, it was mostly smooth sailing for the most part of my life. I, I reached a point where I know that I went through trauma, but it wasn't after later on because I was too busy trying uh, trying to survive for me to sit down and be like, oh, you know what, I'm going through this. I was just trying to survive and I just kept going. In a way, I never deal with it and nothing happened until 2013. So zooming out for a few moments, big question, what leads up to 2013? I mean, I had a really nice childhood. Everything was great to me. Around the time when I was 12, 13, uh, my life changed completely. And not only mine, but my siblings and my mom's. Because at that time, we were victims of human trafficking. You were 12. Your dad isn't around? He was actually the one doing the whole deal. The guy from Mexico? Yes. Marries a German woman. Yes. I, I don't know the order, but has you and how many other kids? Me, I'm the oldest, and three more. What does that look like, trafficking your family? What did, what happened? We we were light, obviously. We were light, like, oh, we're going to have a better life. We go here. I have some family. I have some friends. I have done this in the past. So we get to the border, and it's like, oh, I forgot some papers. You guys go with these people. They're my relatives. And we went. And that's the last time that we saw them. That's the last time you saw your father? Yeah, that was 35 years ago, something like that. Now, let me tell you something. I do not get surprised very often on this podcast. I have people tell me about jumping off of buildings. Right. I have people telling about shooting themselves in the head. And obviously, they survived because we're talking. Right. Assault, traumas. Wow, Raul. I don't even know how to talk about trafficking. I know very little about it. These people take you and your mom. Are you prostituted? Uh, No. Actually, we were lucky because we were not. We were inside of a house for about a year, a year and a few months, doing work, putting things together, kind of thing. We we wouldn't be able to go to school, go out, play on the streets. So everything was inside of a house for the most part. And you're undocumented. Yes. So you, you really don't have any place to go. And you don't know anything. And you don't know anything. So this happened, and we were there for a year and a few months because we needed to pay what is called a fee. Once I think that we're satisfied or whatever, we were released. Not even a shirt on our backs, homeless, uh, the culture shock. We have no idea what, what we're doing. So we went homeless for another a few months, about a year. And so just to be clear, this is your mom? Four children. Raul's yes. the oldest. He's still young. And yes. three younger siblings. Yes. And you're where? In Southern California somewhere? Yes. Did everybody live and end up like at least finding somewhere to have a stable something? 
my my mom put up with so much stuff to keep us safe and and give us everything. Like in a year later, we were so stable, we were so good. Every one of us, we were able to attend school. No money, no cars, no houses, but this is what I can give you, like in the education. And we all got a very good education. I ended up graduating from college. Hmm. So I'm just thinking back to something you said, is that you make it to 2013, you're just living your life, you're st- surviving. Oh. Did the same thing happen or work out better or worse or differently for your siblings? All of us, we put so much effort and my mom always supported us. One of my sisters is married. She's like, she's been here with the person, two kids. My other sister, she just bought a house a couple of years ago. My brother is in the process of buying a house. He just got a big promotion. So we all did something with our lives. Yeah, man. Your mother must be fucking amazing. We do know for sure if your mom doesn't do what she has to do, you and your siblings are in big fucking trouble. I cannot even imagine. You know, it never occurred to me like how bad it was. It, it took me years to realize like, oh man, that was bad. We could have ended up prostitution, dead, drugs, alcohol. Dude, like I can't believe that you and all your siblings, and yes, I know we're talking about suicide, so it wasn't right. a perfect rosy thing for you. I get that. Right. That's amazing. The likelihood of that happening, it feels like it's this, this, this big. But think about it. We went through all of this. And it never occurred to me, I'm going to let go now. I'm going to commit suicide because we're going through this. Never thought about it. It never, it never crossed my mind. I don't know if suicide works that way. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, exactly. Mid-1980s, when you get trafficked to 2013, graduate high school, graduate college. What else? You have a job. You have a wife. You have a husband. What's it like for you? I have a relationship. I have a wife, three cars. I'm living my life. I have like a nice house. I have my life together. No kids. One daughter. One daughter. And a, an ex-wife or current wife? She was my high school sweetheart. You get married. You have a child. Loosely call it the American dream. I don't know if that's the right word. I actually, in a sense, I was. Everything that was coming my way, everything that I worked for, it was a dream. What did you study? Music. Really? Yes. And what was your work? I used to do a lot of work. I used to do a lot of different jobs and whatnot. Everything, I, I used to fix computers. I still do from time to time. I used to sell at swan meats. I worked on a car wash. I worked as a delivery pizza. Name it, I did. But was the goal in, or the dream in studying music to be a musician? No, actually, it just happened after high school. I got a chance to meet my mentors, and they just blew my mind expanding the music knowledge because I, I knew very little. Well, this is 89, 90. I was already in high school. And I was playing in LA, like the whiskey, the rainbow. You were? What what instrument? Actually, I was playing guitar. Whoa. If I ever meet you, I got to learn that damn thing. It is hard. It's not. Actually, it's not. So I I was playing all of this. I was a rock star. I was living that rock star life. Trust me, my whole life, I love my whole life until 2013. I go to college. My mentors, they teach me so much about college. I started doing blues. I go into jazz. I go into classical music. But I fell in love with jazz because of the freedom. And they were the ones that taught me that I was a teacher, actually. And I became a music teacher. And I've been teaching for the last 24 years. Wow. You're sailing mostly okay. I know at some point you split from your wife. Yes. I know at some point you have a daughter. What happens where it starts to... I, I split with my wife about a few months. It wasn't a year. I'll say like eight months or so that we were not together. Uh, my daughter at the time, she is, I believe she's 15, 16. And I met Sandy. And I'm like, I, I was fascinated. Well, she actually met me through one of my classes because she was taking my class. So I met Sandy and everything went down because she was so attracted to me because of the music, because of my talent and all of those things, which I didn't know at the time. So she made her move for me to start not- noticing her more than a student. So we started a relationship. Oh, oh my God, the turmoil at the beginning was crazy. In my head, I believed that she was the ideal person for me. Okay. So I was gaslighted. I was love bombing, all of those things. So after a few months together, we spent hours, days, we spent weekends together. 
just the two of us, which was great. But we kept breaking off, making up, breaking mm-hmm. off, making up. And in a few months, and this is six months, seven months, one of those times that we break up, which was final, I guess, Sean, within like two, three days afterwards, pain just settled. I mean, the pain that I felt, any other kind of pain, I have broken my bones, I have had cuts, I have done things. I didn't know where to hold myself. Wow. Physical. It wasn't physical. It was the emotion of it. But it was... But you felt it. Everything was coming in a physical sense. Right. So I started crying every single day, nonstop. I will wake up and I will start like crying right, like within two minutes of waking up. And I will cry my like cry the entire day, fall asleep, crying, wake up again and do everything all over again. And you, you can't work at that point, right? I cannot work, eat, take care of myself, like the shower, uh, haircuts, all of those things, like cleanliness, like hygiene, personal hygiene, out the window. Everything's gone. And so is that the year you try to take your life? Yes. How so long into that whole thing did you try? Uh, it was a month. After a month, I couldn't figure out how to stop it. I knew I, I, I wanted to stop it. I'm like, I'm done with this. I cannot do this anymore. Do you remember the first time that suicide idea? It probably didn't come like the first day. I can tell you the date. I can tell you everything about it. How many date? September 18, 2013. Three days before that, that's when I started thinking about suicide. Because I said, this is not working. Okay, I already tried this. I already tried this. I already tried, like, even my family came and, and looked after me and all those things. I think that the night of the 16th, that's when I started planning everything. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to grab all of these pills. I'm going to grab some vodka. I don't drink, but I'm, I'm going to just grab it because I know it's the one with more alcohol. I'm going to grab this, and I'm going to grab as many pills as I can take. That's it. You didn't consider going to a hospital? No, I didn't. But at that time, I wasn't considering not my mom, not my siblings, daughter, mm-hmm. my ex. I, I wasn't thinking of anyone. The only thing that I wanted to do was end this. I just need to end this. And you and you you settled on uh since you're planning it for a little bit of time, you settled right. on pills just because it was you had them? Because they were accessible, I guess. So I had them and I had the alcohol, but actually I, I went out to the store to buy the alcohol. All right. So at, at all these moments, you could say, what the fuck am I doing? But yeah. you, you want it out. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. Even when I was at the store paying for the alcohol, for the vodka, I had a big smile. I was just about to ask you, if I was in that store and I saw you or even said, hey, how's it going? Like, would I have any idea? No. You will be like, oh, this guy's having a great day. He's having a great time. So when people hear this and you and you think about what someone who, quote, he didn't look or act suicidal, that doesn't mean anything. So no. everybody out there, just know that don't be fooled. There's no looking suicidal. Even the cashier at the time grabbed me and we had a little interaction, a quick interaction, and everything was nice. Well, can I just throw out an idea here? If you really want to die or maybe end the pain or somewhere in between and what? you're planning that, why wouldn't you be in a good mood? This is what you want. Exactly. And I can tell you this, Sean, the day before, once I, I had the pills, once I realized I'm going to do alcohol and pills, I stopped crying. Oh, wow. I, I was happy. I, I knew where I wanted to go. I knew what I was going to do. I, I knew everything. So I'm like, you know what? I'm happy. But is there any point when you can remember before then? Oh, last year. I was doing okay. I was a music teacher. I was my life. Could you remember that then? Yes. It didn't matter. I, I honestly didn't matter. At the time, like I said, I was so blinded by the pain that even thinking back, like the good things that have happened in my life didn't make a difference. Why do you think that breakup had such an incredibly profound, almost a kind of fatal effect on you? I have a theory. Uh, my ex uh, projected myself. Like she was mirroring what I wanted. So to me, she looked the best woman that I can imagine because she had the qualities that I was looking for, but she was just faking those qualities for me to be in the relationship. So that's why like, this is the ideal person. I don't want to let go of this person. This person fits everything. I, this is the love story. This is what I read on books. This is what I have heard on music. This is what people talk about real love. Do you think she had any other conditions other than a narcissist? 
Uh, narcissist, and there's another one, because uh, she doesn't have any empathy. So whatever she does. Right. It's just... exactly what I was thinking. She's a psychopath. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't know that to be true, but it sounds like it. I have talked to people and yeah. Does she know what happened with you afterwards? Not at first. So I tried committing suicide and it was one of the good experiences in my life. I know how it sounds, but it was, you know, we have a ritual. When you think about it, the people that do it out of the moment, I understand it. So an impulsive decision, there is no planning. But the people that we can, when I say so, because I planned it, it's like a ritual. I had a couch specifically set up where I was going to sit. I picked my outfit. I, I put the pills on this side, the alcohol on this side. The music that I was going to listen to, the last music, I had it played on. Like I had a playlist on everything. I had my letters because I wrote letters to everyone. Saying goodbye? I Saying goodbye. Trying to uh, explain why? Trying to. I, I couldn't, but I, I tried to. To the point, Sean, I had a like a necklace with that DNR form hanging from my chest. Like, do not resuscitate me. Like, I, I don't want to be resuscitated. Let me ask you a question real quick. If I could have come to your room that day and I said, hey, Raul, man, I got this pill. You take this pill, you're going to feel better tomorrow. Would you have not committed suicide? Yes. Uh, if somebody will have come and offer me an alternate where it will give me peace, because I didn't know what options I had. That was the one that, to me, looked the best, fit the best for what I was going through. Do you remember taking the pills and drinking the vodka? Yes, I do. And I remember do so I was playing a what part of the song. I remember, and I remember a sip, taking the pills, a sip, taking the pills, and so on. By the time that I realized, Sean, they were a big amount of pills. And, and I'm like, this is it. And I remember fading out. That feeling of fading now was beautiful. I felt calm. I felt happy. I felt relaxed. I felt, even my body felt so smooth. And I blacked out. My ex-wife, really weird reason, decides to check up on me. Wow. So she told me later on. She kicked me. She slapped me. I wasn't responsive. Uh, my breathing was super shallow. Uh, I, I was gone. When she called 911, paramedics came. My pulse was so faint that they were thinking like I wasn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. So I wake up in the hospital. The first person that I see is my mom. And I start crying because I saw my mom. It broke my heart doing this to her. That's when I realized, what did I do? I can tell you this. I saw my mom and I was sad about it. But I was so upset. I was full of rage because they stopped me. I, I curse at the doctors and their nurses. I didn't want them to stop me. Yeah, that's pretty clear. They did a whatever checkup. They kept me an observation for a few hours. I felt better. The pain was gone. My therapist says that in a sense, in my mind, I killed the pain. I was making jokes. I was laughing at the... Because my siblings came to see me. Like I said, it was like a party, like a reunion type of thing. And I was so like, hey, nope. You just earned a three-day pass to a psych ward. Oh, yeah. Well, they're not letting you go so quick. How did your siblings respond or react to this situation, you being there? They were afraid. They were afraid. They didn't know how to react. They, 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 they couldn't understand because being me the oldest, I have always been the stronger one. So for them to see me give up, it was like a big switch for them, like their perception. What about your daughter? Did she know about it? She knows now. Well, back then she didn't know at all. I ask of people not to tell her. Everyone respects my wishes. And my ex, her mom, was great at, at doing so. I'm very thankful for her for doing so. Is there any little chance she might hear this? Oh, it's okay. I, I spoke to her and now she knows. And nobody told her but me. She asked me questions and I answered them. So how was the hospital? Horrible. One of my worst experiences. It was horrible. Traumatizing. So I just went through a month of pain nonstop. I tried killing myself and whatever dignity I had left, whatever I have left now, I'm going to be locked up and I'm going to be told where to stand at what time I need to eat and all of those things that I need to do. It's a punishment, Raul. It is a punishment. And that's what they want it to be. The reason I know that is because it's not 
that difficult to understand what an environment might be that feels nurturing and helpful. This isn't that complicated. It's so uh, incredibly obvious that that isn't the place that the only thing that makes sense to me is, yeah, we know it's a punishment. Fuck you for trying. I believe that to my core. I the people that are making these decisions, that's at least a part of the way they think. I, I know. And, and it's crazy because it feels like that. It, it is like that. Like you did this. Now we're going to punish you. So you don't do it again. Like we're not going to help you. We're not going to try to talk to you. We're not going to do anything. You are going through this because we want you to go through this. So you don't do it again. Three days later, you get out of the hospital. I run out of there. They didn't want to let me out because my insurance was very good at the time. Oh, really? There's a second part to my thing. It's not just that they want to punish you. You have good insurance. I have great insurance. If we let you out and we replace you with somebody else, they might not. Why don't we keep you in? Yeah. That has nothing to do with Raul's will be. Nothing. Nothing. That's fucking criminal. Well, who is going to believe me because I'm this crazy person that just tried to- Exactly. And they know that. It should be said. I think a lot of people involved in that whole- space are very yeah. well-meaning not all of them are evil but yeah. there's enough people in powerful positions that are fucking evil and maybe psychopathic themselves or profit driven or whatever no doubt about it and this is the crazy thing with the doctor the psychiatrist that i was with it he saw me asked my name the reason why i tried doing it within five minutes is like oh you have depression you're depressed five minutes it took five yeah. minutes for him. and i was put on pills and i was like the whole works. Yeah. The whole works. But I, I run out of there because I said they wanted to keep me for two weeks, but they couldn't. They couldn't because I, 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 it was just that one time. Like I, I, I click again and I was myself again. So I wasn't thinking suicide anymore. I went back to my life. I'm going to therapy. I'm doing better. I finally get to open my own uh, business. I took a chance and I'm like, I'm going to do this thing for myself. I'm going to open this. I started doing more traveling. I started doing better. Three, four months later, I received a letter from Sandy. This is the woman. This is the woman. And I opened it thinking I'm doing well. Big mistake. Why is she reaching out to you? Why does she care at this point? She wasn't done with me. So she reached out to me. I fell for it again. Let's start the dance all over again. You started dating her again. Anybody in your life who knew that would have said, please don't do that. Everyone says so. She's good at what she does, even though it's evil. She's great. She actually, she's great, Sean. And she made this circus about getting into a fight with the parents because she was living with the parents at the time. And she ended up moving out with me. Did she know you tried to? Yes. What did she say or do? Why, why did I do that? And what's the reason? And what I told you? you caused me this much pain and you this, this this much damage to me. So when a psychopath gets psychopath like her gets blamed, what does she how does she respond to that? How does she deflect to that or make it your fault? Tell me. Just very simple. She's not in charge of me. She doesn't make decisions for me. So that was my decision. She was never at fault. She's not wrong. I mean, it was your decision. Yeah. That really yeah. wasn't the whole point. But okay. I, I took it. Okay. We ended yeah. up blaming. Seven years together. After? Yes. And it was in a circus the whole time? It was a circus. It was a lie since the beginning. She was lying from the beginning. But I mean like day in and day out. Was there ever stability? Or was it always fucking nuts? For three months at the beginning, it was nice. It was stable. It was great. But after that, Sean, it was stressing. I was anxious. I was all over the place because she kept me like bouncing back and forth, different things. Uh, he will keep me busy with something while she will do something else. Do you think she was having other men in her life? She was. Oh, Sean, if if I tell you everything that she did, you wouldn't believe it. All this at the end I learned, but just knowing was a thrill. I completely shocked, like to my core. So I'm going to, I'm going to guess that between 2013, when you tried, and then when you ended it in 2020, you didn't try again. No, I didn't. It was better and I kept working hard and I did a bunch of other things. I was in a band, we recorded an an album, I was taking more trips, I was going to different places. My work got better. I was making more money. I mean, everything was going better. And who broke up with who? I did. Really? Yes. 
It was hard, but it was easy because she had a list, Sean. You know, you make your schedule. On January 7th, I'm going to do this. On February something, I'm going to do this. So she made a list starting from June and ending on October, where she's like, oh, I'm going to look for a new place to live. I'm going to look for a storage place where to put my stuff. Do this. I'm going to send the invites for my party in September. I'm going to do this, this, so on, so on, so on, so on, whatever. And then oh, I'm going to spend this time with Raul in Vegas. And then we're going to celebrate this birthday on this day. And then October 3rd, no, September 3rd, I'm going to break up with Raul. It's that calculated. Yes. We're going to break up this day, but before we do that, we're going to go to Vegas. And I imagine she's never thinking, and tell me if I'm wrong, though, I might be wrong. How is Raul going to feel? No. And on, on, on Vegas, uh, Sean, it was like a honeymoon to us. She was like all over me. It, it was great. I, I didn't see it. But you knew that she was going to break up with you, no? I didn't see the list until September 6th. Oh, shit. So I found the list until September 6th. So I never saw the list until later on. That's when I broke up. I, I couldn't stand it. I, I broke up with her like right away. How'd she respond? She was happy. She moved out three days, but she was like done. It was already planned. This is when last year? September? September 6th. That's the day that I broke up with her. That's the day that I found the list. And I found the list randomly. It was like I was looking for the list. But now I don't know if it was random or she left it out a little bit for me to pick it up and see it. By that Friday, I was in therapy. I decided like, you know what? Last time this happened, let me go the other way around. Let me try the way people do it. So I got into therapy and I, I, I tried my best and I kept doing my best. I wasn't working, exercising, using other forms, using different things, reading books, doing, doing everything. The years that I spent with all the ta- tactics that they use a narcissist, damage was so, so much that and it's been very, very hard to get here. That's the reason why I started looking for suicide because it's like I'm done. Before I skip to suicide, where I found your podcast. So I broke up with her on um, September 2021. My mom health is declining. And I didn't know this because I was isolated from my family. So I didn't get to see them as much. Uh, New Year's come 2022. Everything is going well. My mm-hmm. mom needs to go to the hospital February 4th. She gets intubated February 6th. And she passes away on the 16th. So I lost my mom this year, February 16th. Nothing else matters after that. Right. March of that year, uh, my March of this year, there was a point in time when I'm like, nothing matters. I have no feelings. I don't have any feelings for anyone. Today, still. Feelings of the sense that I'm so numb. I'm, my feelings are so numb that I don't take you into account for my decisions anymore. And that was basically sparked by your mom's passing. That was added to the after yeah. the relationship. You've told that to your therapist? Yeah. They try helping me. They try giving me exercises. They try doing things. We, we try different. I went from Lexapro to another one to another one. So I tried different medications because the medications were doing nothing. They're doing nothing. But I tried each one for at least three months. No changes in. I don't feel anything on the sense that I don't have that barrier, so to speak, that wall, that boundary. I do consider, like I said, in March, I thought about it. And I found a way to do it. Actually, I learned a way to do it. And I tried it. And it worked. No, it didn't. You're alive. Well, it worked. But I was able to stop halfway because I wasn't ready. It was going to work. But it, it was like everything. Like I, if I could have waited a little bit longer, it would have like gone. Do you wish it had, you had waited a little longer? No. No, at that time. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. No, no, no. As I... S- talk to you today do you wish you had waited longer or do you wish the pills had worked in 2013 i wish 2013 had worked 2013 yes 2013 i I wish that time it would have work done that's it uh this time in march i I still needed a couple of things to leave in order for me to be ready why didn't you share about the method hanging yes I, i was able to put enough weight in a way to not even hang hang so I don't even need a chair or anything like that. Is that also in your home? That was in my home. Is that in the room where you are right now? Yes. So you can see the spot where you almost hung yourself? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Hang on. Let me back up for one sec. I've got a question. But you said that you couldn't feel anything. Yes, but it's just me like thinking ahead. 
And this is the crazy part about like when people say, oh, suicide is very selfish. It is not. I'm thinking what I know that I'm on the cusp. Of, I don't know what level. I don't know sure. how intense, how bad, but I know that I'm going to cause it. Yeah. That doesn't prevent me from thinking, how do I minimize it? How do I make it not as bad, I guess? And that's one of the things that I appreciate that a lot of us feel when people say, and I feel very offended with people, oh, society is very selfish. No, I think about them. They don't stop me the way other people get stopped by them. Like, oh, I have a wife, or I have kids, or I have this, or I have my job, whatever it is. To us, we don't have that anymore. More at least to me. So from March till now, what is it? That's how you feel? More or less. And I've been trying to find the key, the little light. People say, with time, it gets better. Hold on a little bit. Wait a little bit. Wait the next day, so on, so forth. So I'm like, okay, I'm not an expert, but let's see if it gets better. Let's, let's try your way. I have the time because now, and this is the crazy part, because in March is like, I know I can do this anytime that I want to, if I want it. So now I'm giving you as a gift, my time. And you know what I think it is? Once you try committing suicide, you don't have that idea anymore. You don't have that fear. You don't have, you don't fear that anymore. It isn't like, oh, I'm going to die tomorrow. What's going to happen? It's like, I already thought what's going to happen. I already knew what was going to happen in a sense. I mean, I, I don't know for sure. I know down here in Mexico, a whole lot of people are Catholic, and they probably say you're going to hell. I, I don't care. I don't have religion, and that's the other thing. That's the German side. That's the German, German side. Religion. And I try. Trust me, with this March of this year, I try. I went to different churches. I follow different. I try getting into different things. But I do feel fake. I don't believe them. And I'm, I'm being honest about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that I changed from 2013 to 2021. 2013, I kept hiding. I kept everything in, inside. I kept bottoming everything. 2021 is like, nope. If I say something, if I think something, I'm going to say how it is, how I feel it. I'm not going to hold back anymore because I've been doing this for the longest time. So you haven't tried then since March? No, no. I've been close, but I always think five more minutes, five more minutes. I'll have a coffee, see how I feel after I have some coffee. But I, I can tell you this. And, and again, this is again against popular belief. No one can prevent it. No one. If we already set up our minds, if, like I said, I set up my mind in 2013, I was a happy guy going to the store, buying a whole, having a good conversation. Nobody's going to know. I'm mm-hmm. going to do it whenever I feel like doing it. And I think that's one of the things that we like, that we have that power. Yeah. I imagine when you were younger, uh, you absolutely loved playing the guitar, right? I loved it. If you I, were to pick up the guitar today and play it, would you love it the same way? No. No, because there are too many attachments to music with my ex, with Sandy. So every time that I try to even listen to a very random song, something will remind me of her and trigger something in me. You went through this thing as a kid, but you just didn't deal with it. Right. Where does that all come into play in all of this? It actually, I like that it came out. On my therapist, like I said, I will tell my therapist everything to the point where she said that I worked on it through the years on my own and I made my peace with it because I forgive the people because they were not even at that point, I guess. They were not guilty in a sense. We worked on my father's side type of thing. We worked on a couple of things. But for the most part, she said that I forgive him like a long time ago. That was that was new to me to be honest like the entire therapy sessions has been new to me a lot of things that i didn't know that i had things that i was i guess doing that i kind of like everyone does this because it's normal and i see people doing it so it's okay for me to do them or follow them the same way so that's that's when it comes into play i mean because i i said is it because of this is it because of that and i keep asking am i bipolar am i a narcissist, am I this, am I this? And, and my therapist is a great therapist. She will say, no, you're not. Let me give you books for you to read so you can understand what, what it is. Yeah. And I read them and, and we will talk about them. And I, like I said, I've been trying, I've been doing nothing but trying to get better, my life to get better. 
So that's my my approach. I've done it before, and I've been in hard places, but this one is obviously the one that takes the cake. This now, if was, Sandy calls you tomorrow and wants to get back together, what would you do? I will take a flight, whatever is the first flight that I can. I will run away. I'm afraid of her. How many people know that we're talking right now? My uh, three of my siblings and my daughter. How many people know about your first suicide attempt? Not, I'm not talking about medical professionals. My entire family. Uh, so mo- most of my friends know, and uh, my daughter, my neighbor, even knows that. Okay. What about the second attempt last March? You're the first one. Oh, okay. So nobody found out about that one. Okay. No. All right. So some people will hear it. And now they'll know. Yeah, they will know. Did you keep the suicide notes? I didn't. They were taken the night that I tried committing suicide. Do you think you'll try again? There's a very good possibility. If things don't get better soon, I don't know how long I can hold on. To. Like, I don't have a lot of things to hold on to. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of losing the type of thing. A matter of losing that little light at the end of the tunnel. Once it fades out or something, it's like, okay, I don't have anything else. So are you thinking about it and ideating most days every day? No, actually, no. And that's, that's a good thing. I, I like that part because I'm trying to, as soon as a thought comes, and I feel like I'm going to start thinking about this and I'm going to start planning it. It's like, no, let, let me distract myself. Let, let me do something else. Let, let me not run away from it. I usually, what I do, I sit down, I think about it, I give it 30 seconds for my brain to think about it. Like, okay, how do you feel? Okay, I feel bad. I feel this is getting bad and it's mm-hmm. going to get, okay, 30 seconds, you're done, get up and do something else. How many people do you have in your life to have a, a hard conversation with? About six people. I have, a, trust me, I learn, I learn my lesson and I, I gather a big support as much as I can. Like I said, I've been trying what I've been told, what the book says, the psychologist says, what they think I should be doing. I've been working on it. Do you think if someone told you at, let's say, 20 years old, that at this age, you would have tried to commit suicide or attempt suicide twice, and that you're currently pretty high risk for doing it again, would you have been like, you're out of your fucking mind? Yes. Oh, yes, big time. I would have been like, do you see all that I have, like, what I'm going through, and then all the things that I have accomplished? Like, do you do you think that I'm just going to give up for a really dumb, and I understand this, the logic, a really dumb reason? It's sad because I wish I would have none. At least I wish I would have known, but it, it makes me sad because it's a dumb reason. It's a dumb reason that a great mind. I, I'm, I'm very intelligent. I'm, I'm very, I mean, I study, I, I have all of this. And for this dumb reason to be the reason why I disappear from this world is absurd. What exactly is the dumb reason? The feeling, the pain, the despair, the hopelessness. That's absurd? Uh, it, it is absurd because... Like I said, I've gone through worse pains, I guess, mm-hmm. more challenging times at a really early stage in my life. I know I'm very harsh on myself and I'm working on it. I shouldn't have known better. I should be better by now. You had said earlier that you tend to romanticize suicide. I'm not sure I heard a lot of romanticizing, but I believe you. I think that connects to my question around, usually I ask about myths, right? And you pointed out one, like it's not selfish. There's probably yeah. others. And I want to connect that also to, you had said how you have these ideas or feelings that go against popular belief. It's all really the same thing, a myth or something right. that's going against popular. Like what are, are there any more? Suicide should be a choice like, like anything else. And I think I read this, the director for the suicide something, I can look up the name, I just skip my name. And she put it so well. She compared it to the heart, the muscle of the heart. If you smoke, if you drink, if you do this, if you put all of this, you're putting stress to your heart, then of course you're going to have a heart attack. Suicide is just the same one. It's not just one thing. It's not just, oh, because of this or because I had trauma back in the days or whatever it is. It's a condition. It's just a set of things that happen together. And when that happens, it's like a heart attack. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. It does, but I can see why people would push back. I don't care that they, I mean, fuck them, but I could see where they yeah. say, well, not everybody does it. But see, that's, that's the thing. If you look at me, if you talk to me, you don't think like this person is, has a mental condition. This, But you know, most people don't know this, don't, don't see it, don't, don't feel it, don't, because I don't know, because I, I know how to hide it very well. 
or because of something that I don't have that mental health problem. Or right now I have a bunch of problems. But back then it wasn't like a mental health problem. So I never considered myself like, oh, I have bipolar disease and I need to be on medication or something like that. So it just happened. Like there were too many conditions, too many things happening in my life that just brought all of this. So going through the therapists that is uh, similar to um, domestic abuse, what I went through for seven years. Well, I have the same uh, complex PTSD, the major depressive disorder. So I, I'm coming out with the same symptoms because it's very similar to it. Yeah. My siblings, my loved ones, if I were to commit suicide, I know I'm going to hurt them and they will feel it. My friends, my neighbors, they will feel it because I've been on them for many years. But it's still my choice. It's still my choice. What if I walk outside of my house and for some reason a tree falls on my head and I die? What's the difference? To me, it doesn't make sense. Right. Dead isn't dead. One way is like shameful and the other isn't. Yeah. There's a lot of people who want to kill themselves are just hoping they get in a car accident or because they, they can die without having fucking being shamed. Their life wasn't hard enough. Now you're going to shame them in death. Great. Yeah. Really, really, and really noble. Like you said at the beginning, it's, it feels like a punishment. And it's just uh, you don't do it so uh, because society dictates religion or whatever it is, dictates that you're not supposed to do this. You're not going yeah. to do this way. Even, even if I had a chance, let's say that I plan to commit suicide in three months or whatever length of time, it will be great for me to be able to say my peace to my friends, to my family, to everyone, and for them to understand it. It will be the same thing, like, you know what? I have cancer. They're giving me six months. You make your peace with everyone, and everyone kind of embrace it. I mean, we're never prepared for that, but you kind of embrace it. You kind of understand it. Yeah. Be the same with suicide. In my opinion. Good luck with that. <laughs> I know. If you look at how people respond, famous people dying, it's very different than when they hear about other people dying by suicide. Yeah. I don't know what people are having talking about in their homes, but the coverage is mostly like empathy and oh my God, and, you know, a little bit of, I don't, you know, that's standard. Why? But you don't hear any real shaming. Nope. If you're famous, you get like a pass, I think. Yeah. But if you're not, of course, people are shocked and they're grieving and they do that in all kinds of ways. But, you know, there was still like, there's still some post-death punishment. Yeah. And I'm like, he already died. His life was clearly fucking hard. Yes. Enough. Yeah. You have no idea. Unless the guy comes and tells you this is why. And, you know, we don't even know why. If you ask me, and this came with the letters, if you ask me why, I, I don't know. Is, is the pain, is this, is the biggest disappointment in my life, the disappointments that I've been going through my life, the disappointment of the relationship? It's a combination of things. Right. We don't need a reason because we're already, I mean, people that have tried to commit suicide or been thinking about it. We don't need a reason. It, it, they might not make sense to anyone else. They might not make sense to nobody. This is the thing that I think is very collective among people that have tried to commit suicide, there is a little piece that each of us, we understand. It's just a weird, I don't want to say connection, but it's like, oh yeah, I know what you were going through at the time that you're relating because I have felt that way. Not the same way, not the same reason, not the same events, not the same whatever, but I understand it. And I think that's a very common thing among suicide survivors. What else would you like to share, Raul, in California? We talked about a lot of stuff, but I, I always feel like there's more suicide like one of the things that i told my therapist at the beginning of our sessions i said i'm gonna tell you that i feel suicidal i'm gonna talk straight up with it but it doesn't mean i'm going to do it i'm going to do it right now and to be able to talk about it right huge distinction yes and she was okay promise me that you're gonna be safe we'll do it but it's, it's, it's nicer because now you're not afraid yeah of course not afraid to say it yeah, there's transparency. We don't have yeah. transparency. You don't know what's going to get you locked up. Ask questions. Ask, are you feeling suicidal? Don't hold back. We like that. We like when somebody acknowledges that we are struggling. Well, thanks, man. This has been a really interesting conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me share a little bit of me out there. Glad to do it, man. Thank, thank you, Sean. Thank you for having me. You got it, my friend. All right. Take care. Talk soon. Bye. Ciao. 
As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. Special thanks to Raul out in California. Thank you, Raul. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at suicidenoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And as I say often, please check the show notes. We've got more and more things happening if you want to get involved or participate, including our membership, which is now live, ways you can sponsor, ways you can volunteer, and more. And of course, if you listen on Apple, please rate and review the podcast. It really helps people find it, and we want more people to find it. No matter how you are involved or participate, thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. And that is all for episode number 148. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon.